we were like as much soul boys as we were punks. And the kind of vibe between us and our, and our mates in Bristol, you'd, it was as much going to like a, there was this soul club called Foster's where all the kind of kit chaps would go to and they'd all get dressed up in like 50s clothes and dance to like Fat Bat Band and Ultra Funk and, and like lots of wicked American imports and do like these mad dances, right? And out of that thing which was called the Avon Soul Army, everybody would be into like getting like zoot suits and, and, and like pink pointed toed winkle pickers and stuff. <laughs> The Bristol kind of punk scene was as much a fashion scene involved with the, with the Soul Boys, as I'm saying, as it was a kind of punk scene. So one night you'd go to see the Pistols, everybody being wearing like mohair jumpers and like pink pegs and stuff, right? And then you'd go back to the Soul Clubs. <laughs> Bristol had very much this sort of soul boy scene. And, um, you know, we were just brought up on, people played James Brown and everything there. And, uh, Funkadelic, Parliament, it's Bootsy, you know, all these things would be played at these clubs. And uh, that was just the music we were brought up, you know, that's what we heard. But we also had that thing where we'd be listening to Iggy Pop and uh, stuff away from the clubs. <laughs> The pop group was like 78, 79. After punk had happened, we'd seen what, like the Pistols, and go through to the subway set, how they could kind of deconstruct that punk thing. We were just starting, we were like 16. We wanted to mix that funk stuff into the punk stuff. That's what we originally started playing. I actually sort of could play music and uh, as most places have you sort of have the swingers and shakers on the scene and we were part of that sort of scene and um, people would go to different gigs. Uh, Mark went to a couple, you know, Sex Pistols gigs. We went and saw the Ramones and these people and everything had got, you could relate to the people that were up there. They weren't some freaks that you'd never imagine meeting or lived a completely highfalutin lifestyle. It's that you're able to connect and sort of feel, oh wow. I'll have a bit of that. Like a dancing flame on a bed of nails. We were just too unwired and too young to sort of ever, you know, when we had record company meetings, nobody would listen to anybody, you know, no, we just wanted to go our own way, really, and uh, arrogance got us, uh, got us nowhere <laughs> on the commercial front, but... Uh, you have that sort of funny one-upmanship when you're that age, and we just thought we were better than anybody else and nothing else mattered. She is beyond good and evil. She is beyond good and evil. She is beyond. The pop group were, were different as a punk group to other punk groups because their, their frame of reference was wider in that they immediately went to... Uh, to kind of black music forms, the funk, and to, to reggae, especially. I mean, you had other punk groups, you know, flirting with reggae, but basically they were, they were crap, pretty much, I think. But I think the pop group did try and, uh, and actually use these forms in weird jazz and all the rest of it. So I think you've, you've got that there from the, from the beginning. And the punk sort of movement in Bristol was different to elsewhere. It was perhaps more into black music forms, more into reggae, and more intellectual. Yeah, that's old. Them teenagers, I played it because I taught them finally though, they had to suffer. Before the punk days, we were listening to things like the Velvet Underground, and then we were listening to like really heavy kind of King Tubby dub stuff, right? And I kind of, you know, I kind of grew up a little bit up the hill and went to a school here, but I went to a youth club here, and I went to the, I went to the blues here, so, so, the, maybe the interesting thing about Bristol is all the races mix a lot more than they would in Manchester or something because the, the supposedly ghettos aren't so separated. Because he liked his playing, <laughs> but my 
Interest went deeper. I always remember reading that Iggy Pop and the MC5 had played with this guy called Sun Ra. And in fact, on the first MC5 record, there's a record, that, there's a track that's credited to Sun Ra. So then somehow I discovered who this Sun Ra guy was, and then that was it for me. This was, this was much, this was great for me because this was really extreme music. <laughs> the pop group started the situation where you could take a massive amount of influences and throw them, put them together, and make them work. And not, you know, you're either a reggae band or you're a jazz band or you're a rock band. We say no, you can take a bit of this and a bit of that and put it in a melting pot and it will come out and it will, you know, you've, you've made something new, you've made a new sort of colour basically. And uh, I took that on with Rip Rig, which I feel was the, the most naturally sort of mixed race band. Panic was a pretty crazy collective of a spontaneous group. You know, we never rehearsed, we refused to rehearse. And we used to try to do live um, improvised music, but with a sort of a spontaneous edge. After the pop group had split up, right, I'd been really into reggae. And I kind of linked up with this friend of mine, Adrian Sherwood, who was like producing all the Prince Farai, Prince Hammer stuff, and putting out loads of really good kind of reggae dub plates on his own label, Hit and, Hit and Run. But then through this other, this girl band called The Slits, we kind of linked up with him. And through him, I kind of got in contact with like the heaviest kind of Jamaican musicians who were living in London. People who played with like Ranking Dread, Gregory Isaacs, you know, this really good Jamaican rhythm section of like resident in, in London. And the first, the first kind of form of my second band, the Mafia, was this kind of Jamaican rhythm section. That's when we started experimenting with the dub things and, and, and stuff like that. In 1980, April the 2nd, you have the St Paul's Riot, which I mean, is an important event in Bristol generally, and it's very important for the story about the Bristol Sound, because there's people who are on the records of the Bristol Sound who were there on that, on that day. You tend to you know, remember the disturbances in Brixton and Birmingham and Wolverhampton and all the rest of it, but this was before that. They all came after. This is the first of the kind of the protests against uh, Thatcher. From the days of the right onwards, you've got this sort of alliance between punks, in a way, and, bl and black kids who are, are, ought to be into just reggae, but they're, they're not. And they'd always been in kind of British um, Afro-Caribbean communities. There'd always been a split between people who are into soul and people who are into reggae. And I think hip-hop allowed that to kind of come together in a way. In that hip-hop, I think, was kind of revenge on reggae because it made that soul element hip once again and it gave it a cultural background. <laughs> There is a sense in which St Paul's is, is 
the hardcore of a certain kind of lifestyle and a certain kind of tradition that white people would aspire to, to not necessarily to belong to, but to be associated with. But they can maybe go into the blues dancers, and evidently blues dancers used to be much, much freer in terms of racial relations than they are these days. But what happens instead, the blues dance comes to Clifton in, in the dugout. You get a kind of naturalised, domesticated version of West Indian Bristol culture smack dab in, uh, in Clifton, in the posh area. And uh, it's at the dugout where you get the mix of the kind of the old style Bristol sound people like Mark Stewart of the pop group, uh, Rip Rig and Panic, Maximum Joy and uh, Scream and Dance, these, these other groups that kind of come out as satellites from the pop group, Naina Cherry. You get this kind of sort of white bohemian punk culture and then you get the working class kind of black Rastafarian culture as well. Now at that time down the, the dugout, it had its little sections. It had its hippie section, it had its black section, and then we had a little sort of punk section. And on the whole, in the, the beginning, the music would have been later on at night the more black stuff but there was still it was run by it was run by a couple of kind of hippie guys so i can't remember there's kind of hippie music as well <laughs> whatever that is <laughs> <laughs> Reading of the dugout that made it such a successful place, I'd say, basic mixture of people. As far as where do you come from, I think it was just something that just hit upon from all directions. It wasn't like, say, <clears throat> one person came along and said, this is what we're listening to. It was just a whole load of things all merged in together at one time, and then it just went bang, and it all happened. When you begin to get the emergence of hip hop from 1980 onwards with Grandmaster Flash and African Bambata and stuff like that, then you get the formation of what became the Wild Bunch sound system, which began when Grant Marshall, Daddy G from Mass of Attack, began acting as the DJ at the dugout from 1982. They are the first sound system in Bristol uh, playing hip hop. Uh, they're not the first in the country, but they're pretty early. It sort of really just sort of happened in about 82. All of a sudden we started hearing rap tunes, you know, even though we'd heard them before. We hadn't really taken that much notice about them before, you know, but when, you know, all of a sudden it started to seem to be Hey, this is really this is really looking good. Do you know what I mean? This is you know some really good rap tunes coming out, you know. And then it was you know it's a sort of um, you know it, it, first it started with that sort of funky style. You know, it's more f funk uh, with rap on top, and then it went more hip hop ish where you had more raw beats. So that's what that the bass was. Well, someone mixing a raw beat, cutting it up, a bit of scratching and you've got your rappers rapping and, and you basically mage your own tune there and then on the spot. What happened in the dugout is suddenly people started going to New York like some of the massive attack kids and the wild bunch kids were going to New York and buying like 12 inches and trainers and people were like bringing back tapes of this radio station called WBLS and Kiss FM out of New York. And um, people suddenly started playing this hip hop thing on a, on a, on a strictly Bristol tip. These kind of wild bunch tapes used to, used to just circulate around everybody's mates, you know. Anyway, I got a copy which I originally think came from Grant, 
and on one of the Kiss FM tapes was this, was this sound of a rocket taking off with these really heavy drum machines underneath it, which, uh, that, which just blew my mind. And I just kept on playing it to Adrian in the studio, and we were trying to copy it in the studio. I told Adrian this tune was on Tommy Boy, and Adrian just went over and started chatting to the Tom Silver from Tommy Boy, and was saying this, this mate of mine in Bristol was just going crazy about this, this, specific, this specific sound of just like a rocket taking off. Through that, we got through to like Keith LeBlanc and Doug Wimbish and Skip. I really, really looked up to the kind of rhythms they'd cut for like Grandmaster Flash and the sequence and all this stuff on Sugar Hill, right? And for me, and the kind of, the kind of new electro sound, for me, that was the sound, right? And I kind of dragged them over to England and started working on one of my records. They were using like electronic drums and stuff, right? And Adrian was mixing it, dub, dub mixing it live, bass guitar and like Simmons drums and stuff, exactly the same, the same cuts they do for Sugar Hill. They felt through like meeting it with me, they could kind of go totally over the edge and express this stuff they hadn't even got out of their hearts since they were like playing like weddings or something. And so this, suddenly this, this huge kind of noise started erupting. I get the energy from hip hop the same as I drew kind of energy from reggae or something. I reacted, if I'm honest, I reacted completely against the, the whole sort of um, cooler than thou sort of situation. And I went the completely opposite way and said, right, because I'd been in that scenario for a hell of a long time, you know, that's everybody watching what you do. And I just I had enough of it. So I did the uncoolest thing I could do and made a kinky rock band. I've gone such crazy paths. I've lost people all the, with every change that I've made in my, my direction. I've lost the people that, I've made really extreme changes in my music. Whereas someone like Mark, to his credit, some would say is virtually, you know, you heard the record he was making, they, they're very similar ilk all the way down. So he never loses his audience. What's interesting now is that I've been making kind of supposedly out there weird music for so many years and had a certain success all, all around the world but the kind of music that we're making to people who've kind of grown up on like acid house or the first club they went to was like a kind of rave when they were 14 they heard all these weird kind of synthesizers and drum machines going off or like the jungle clubs or even like people who've even listened to bjork remix albums or something their ears are a lot more open to the kind of crazy sounds we've been making for years Maybe the only thing, the, the good thing I did about the Bristol scene was prove a point that you could make records and you could tour abroad. And it was possible without, you know, through a kind of independent setup and you could do what you wanted to do, which maybe a few people took notice of.
and it gave them the confidence that Mark's gone off and done that. Maybe who'd never actually thought about it again. Maybe Nelly or, or, or Miles or Grant might have thought, oh, if Mark can do it, I can do it. You know? And that kind of disrespect and that kind of nonchalance has survived through to, to, through, through to all the way. Going back to the old pop group days and stuff, I've seen mates join bands and become famous and started walking around with sombreros and like dark sunglasses on in the pub when you're with your mates, right? The respect I've got for Tricks and Massive and the Porter's Head Kiddies and stuff and, and Smith and & Mighty and all the Jungle Kids is they're staying true to their roots. Maybe one day somebody's working with Madonna, but they still come back the next night and, and, and hang out in the club. Not just the musicians, but the whole of that 200 clan of our posse or our mates have got the same attitude in whatever they're doing in life and everybody's quite down to earth. The roots are there and, and, and the, 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 way the, the way the Bristol scene will progress is from those roots and the respect for the roots. And that's what's coming out in like the Ronnie Size stuff and the Dope Dragon stuff and stuff. It's like everybody's still down on the, nobody's bought a castle in bloody Spain. Walking past my window. Worried expression on his face. I'm gonna sit here in my window and get easy going. Billy didn't bring his paintings down then. <coughs> I knew he wouldn't. Such a late In the 70s, pop musicians were much more than just selling records. They were actually seen as some sort of spiritual things, maybe starting with the Hendrix and these people. These guys were ob obviously Jim Morrison and Hendrix. They appeared to have some other kind of light going on with them. And this was followed through with maybe sort of Bob Marley and people like this. There was something else going on with these characters. It wasn't just selling records. It's got to have that extra, what I think of as like the fourth dimension, or it's just a relatively pointless exercise, really. Soon I became restless by nature. I put on my slippers and walked to the dark. Outside stood the postman. He handed me puzzles. You can have he said a I bring presents. You can have a whole I was very lucky that when I started, I came out of a sort of a kindred spirit with, uh, say, punk rock, where you were able to. What you were doing was much more than just the three chords you were banging out, or it was the actual attitude had something more than just the music. It wasn't just the music, there was another dimension to everything you were doing, which, uh, and we got away with it then, so I felt that's what you should always do. Follow your bliss and you can uh, express that, then it will have a, it'll have a spiritual feeling to it, hopefully. Legalize it, yeah, yeah, and I will advertise.